Welcome, everyone, to another broadcast of Majoring in the Majors with Pastor S.J. Munson on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available as podcasts. You can find them at artistfirst.com. Your host is the author of two books, The Treasure of Israel and Christ Held Hostage, The Hijacking of American Christianity. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Pastor S.J. Munson. Hi, this is S.J. Munson, and welcome to our show. Um, here in the U.S., there are over 40,000 gun-related deaths each year and nearly one mass shooting each day. The number of children killed by firearms exceeds, actually exceeds the annual deaths of military personnel and police officers. No one needs to tell us that we have a gun problem here in America. It's something that's now always in the back of our minds. It's unfortunately perhaps tragically, become life as usual here. But how did we get here, and how do we find a way out of this crisis? Are there any solutions? Uh, Tonight, to talk about uh, this uh, problem, we have an expert in gun violence and criminology, Dr. Thomas Gabor, who's a former professor of criminology for 30 years at the University of Ottawa. He's the author of over 200 books and articles, including uh, the books Confronting Gun Violence in America, Enough, Solving America's Gun Violence Crisis, and his latest book, Carnage, A Study of Mass Shootings in the U.S. He has served many times as a consultant and expert witness to such governing bodies as uh, the uh, United Nations um, and Canada's Parliament and Department of Justice. Uh, Dr. Gabor, thank you so much for making time for us tonight. Thank you for having me on, Pastor. Now, um, certainly uh, researching the area and being an expert in, in um, uh, gun violence, it, it, certainly not for the faint of heart. <laughs> How did you first get interested in this um, very, very deep topic of gun violence? Well, I've been um, studying uh, violence in general and teaching about it from the late 70s. And uh, in in 19 in the 1980s i co-authored a book on armed robbery so i guess that's when my career in this area began and uh, in the 1990s my uh, uh, in canada the department of justice contacted me actually to review the research in this area to to see whether in fact uh, if you increase the number of guns in the society is there going to be more homicide suicide and accidental deaths. Uh, Then as well, Mm -hmm. I did work on, uh, for the United Nations on regulations around the world. So what type of restrictions are there on firearms around the world? And I've written many articles on the subject uh, since then. And as you mentioned, the number of books, Uh, just to to give a little bit of background, uh, Uh, the book Confronting Gun Violence in America, which I started working on after Trayvon Martin was killed. So Mm -hmm. here down in Florida, of course, that uh, killing very much resonated with much of the population. Uh, And I reviewed in that book um, the connection between guns, gun laws, and violence. I've also written a book called Enough on Solutions, uh, to gun violence following the Parkland horror here in Florida. Uh, and as you mentioned, I have a book called Carnage, which covered mass shootings in the United States in nine, uh, sorry, 2019 and 2020. I just like to, I, you laid out the uh, problem quite well in your introduction. The only area I would correct you on is we're now up to almost two mass shootings a day in America. So we've approached. Mm. In 2021, we approached um, uh, 700 mass shootings a year. So the last couple of years, things have exploded, and I'll be happy to discuss that with you and your audience today. You know, this show goes out uh, across the world to many different countries, hundreds of countries across the world, and probably very difficult for people outside the U.S. to wrap their minds around 
this issue. It seems inconceivable um, that we tolerate this level of gun violence. Um, and yet, how, how did we get here? Um, how, um, you know, politically, um, historically, how did we get to this point of crisis as, as a nation? Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question. I'm frequently asked that by people from the international community who say that given everything we've seen with the mass shootings and gun violence in the United States, have any gun laws been passed to address this problem? And I tell them that at the federal level, we have not passed in the United States a major law concerning uh, addressing gun violence since 90, in the middle 1990s when we had the assault weapons ban and the background check Brady Bill was passed. So we have not addressed this. And of course, political gridlock is a large part of that. But just to, to give uh, an overall picture of how we got here, I think the evidence is very clear that uh, one of the answers to that is that simply the high level of gun ownership in the United States. Um, when we compare ourselves with every other country in the world, the level of civilian gun ownership in the U.S. stands out. Uh, so we have approximately 120 guns for every 100 people. And as you mentioned, over 40,000 gun deaths a year. Uh, so, and uh, we have 25 times the rate of gun homicide as other high-income high income countries. So clearly, Having a large number of guns is not making us safer, though the gun lobby and certain activists uh, in, in the gun owning community, not all gun owners, because the majority of gun owners believe in some basic reasonable uh, measures to deal with gun violence, but they keep telling us we should get armed and the more arms the better, but certainly the evidence doesn't support that at all. because. We stand out relative to the rest of the world in our gun ownership levels, and at the same time, we stand out in terms of the uh, levels of gun homicide and gun deaths compared to other countries. But there are other factors as well. We see in the United States um, increasing economic inequality. Uh, for example, in 1980, um, the top 10% made uh, of the population made nine times the income of the bottom 10 percent now they're making close to 13 times the income and i found in my own research and others have found as well that there is a connection be between major economic inequality and gun violence uh, so for example i looked at um distressed communities and the way that's defined uh, is not just po communities with a high level of poverty but uh, with many business closings and few business openings many vacant homes a population that isn't uh, uh, doesn't have a college education or a high level of people who have no more than a high school education and we found that the higher level percentage of the population that lives in a distressed community, the more likely it is that you're going to have more mass shootings as well as homicides. So, for example, in Detroit, this was astounding to me, 98% of the population in Detroit lives in a distressed community, as I've described, with high poverty, few uh, prospects in terms of employment, for the population, many vacant homes, and so forth. So uh, we see uh, increasing economic inequality, and that ultimately uh, the entire society pays a price because you have a hopelessness among a segment of the population, um, desperation, and desperate people often do desperate things because they feel that they have nothing to lose. And we mm. see, yeah, and so we do see in com certain communities in the United States, uh, a high percentage of young people who have few prospects for uh, productive life uh, and consequently turn to guns and violence 
as a means to cope. Mm. It's been said, uh, violence is the language of the unheard. Um, it's certainly relevant in this case as you're laying out the case for that. Um, so we talked about, you know, just having so many guns in, in circulation leads to more in violence. Um, economic inequality leads to uh, frustration and uh, anger um, in certain communities. Um, anything else that would contribute to this, this problem? Yeah, well, this issue, we do find a disproportionate amount of gun homicide in uh, communities of color. And, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, approximately uh, 40 or 50 percent of mass shootings occur in African-American communities, and these are often these very distressed communities. Uh, and we do have huge disparities in income between African Americans and the white population, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, disparities in education, disparities in opportunity. Uh, so I think it's very important to address these issues. And following, we had a surge in violence, as I'm sure anybody who reads a newspaper these days or watches television knows we've had a surge in violence during the pandemic. And we see uh, gun violence increasing by, uh, or gun homicide increasing by 30% in the United States in 2020, another additional 5% last year. And I attribute that to two things. All the uh, issues, the fallout, if you will, from the pandemic, from increasing economic desperation, we have anti-violence programs that have shut down. We have more young people who were not at work or in school. And, and so there's a whole series of cascading effects and mental health effects from the pandemic. But we also saw at the same time the terrible case of, uh, of George Floyd and um, in Minneapolis and a number of other killings of unarmed black men by the police. And uh, we, we have seen previously as well that when these racial injustices, major injustices occur, uh, that you have anger, uh, you have a sense of hopelessness, and as well what we call more street justice. So we already have strains, if we're honest about it. We have great strains in the United States, often between law enforcement and the African-American community, sometimes the Hispanic, Latino community as well. And all you need is some type of match. And this type of event, which we all saw, where a police officer basically suffocated the murder George, George Floyd over eight minutes on national television, and that sets off a sense of uh, just ignites uh, even greater hostility and alienation from the police. And so what do these communities do? They reach out even less to the police. If there's a conflict or a dispute, and they tend to handle it themselves. So you see more street justice. You see more citizens taking the law into their own hands rather than turning to the police. So that increases violence as well. Mm -hmm. It certainly doesn't help, um, as you touched on, having um, such a powerful gun industry pouring millions into lobbying and propaganda here. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, talking points, I guess, of the NRA is, you know, the only solution uh, for a, a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Um, there are a lot of those talking points. Um, how do you counter those? Um, and what, what are some other uh, talking points that uh, you find that, that people either, either believe or at least repeat? Yes, I'm glad you asked that because the book I'm currently working on, I don't have a title for it yet, but it'll probably be out in the next six months, is precisely that debunking misinformation from the gun mm. lobby and from uh, extremists, let's say gun extremists, I'll call them, because I don't want the listener to believe that I'm saying that every gun owner is an extremist. It's not the case at all. 
but the position of the NRA, for example, has often been at odds with their own membership, and they've been far more extreme. So, mm. yes, this notion that they've been promoting for the last 30 years of the armed citizen, you know, that if only we can arm most of us, that's the best way. And in fact, uh, uh, Wayne Lapierre, the CEO of the NRA, said it's the only way, right, to counter a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, and it's a total fallacy. Uh, there are many studies that show uh, that gun-owning um, civilians rarely actually stop a crime in progress. There was a study, for example, by the FBI that showed that uh, in a 160 after shoot, active shooter incidents, only one was stopped by a civilian uh, with a mm. firearm. Actually, there are more civilians who, without guns, and this is the same for uh, school shootings, there are more who talk down the shooter and try to uh, and de-escalate the situation than are successful using guns. And the problem is, you know, uh, because of this 30-year campaign by the NRA, that increasing an increasing number of Americans believe that an arm in the home, a weapon in a home, makes us safer. And mm. when we actually look at the data on that, we find that for every killing of an intruder by somebody who has a gun in the home, 22 people living in that household die as mm. a result of either a homicide, so you have a case of domestic violence, which escalates to death because there's a gun in the home, or somebody commits suicide in the home, or there's a deadly accident in the home. So 22 to 1, you know, that that gun in the home is going to be used against a member of that, their, that household as opposed to against an intruder. So there are many myths about this armed citizen approach. And once again, I would point to anybody to look at other societies. If we were safer with more guns, wouldn't we be the safest <laughs> uh, high-income country in the world, and not the least safe. So mm -hmm. it's clear that all these guns aren't helping us. Another issue is um, uh, the loosening of laws pertaining, for example, to the carrying of guns. And we currently have 21 states that have uh, adopted what we call permitless carry, that you don't even need a license. You don't need special vetting. You don't need training. Um, or anything uh, in, uh, in order to carry, uh, to carry a gun. Uh, so, uh, and any trainer will tell you that's crazy. And if you look at law enforcement, they're continuously training their personnel so that they will understand when it's appropriate to use lethal force uh, and they understand, they need to understand how to handle guns safely they need to make sure that when they use a firearm, they don't shoot a fellow police officer or a bystander. There's so much involved and there's so much stress in a combat situation. There's just no way that, you know, we're turning out uh, so many people across the country. Millions of people are carrying guns who are unfit to do so and, in my view, pose a much greater danger to public safety than they pose a benefit. I'll just mm -hmm. give you one other example. You mentioned the, uh, the myths and the misinformation. Uh, I debunk, as I say, about 40 of these in my upcoming book. Another one is the notion that guns don't kill, people kill. Mm -hmm. And sure, on the surface, there is a kernel of truth in that. I mean, and no gun ever got up off a table by itself and shot somebody. So yes, there is a person involved uh, who is either acting recklessly or motivated to kill uh, or acting on impulse. But the weapon, too, matters. And um, we're seeing, uh, just one illustration, uh, we're seeing more mass shootings today, even though our um, emergency response has improved over, say, 30 years ago. Uh, treatment has uh, improved in the medical system. Transportation to trauma centers has improved. 
but why are we seeing more people dying uh, in mass shootings and why are we seeing deadlier mass shootings and you can't get away from the fact that it, a, a, a big part of that reason is the proliferation of military grade weapons in the population that we probably have something like 20 million of these assault style rifles now which were designed for the military um, so uh, we see that when these assault style weapons are used in mass shootings more people die and i'll just give one illustration pastor uh, there was the Dayton shooting in Dayton, Ohio in 2019. There were so many mass shootings, I don't expect the audience is going to remember them all, but this was quite a large one in Dayton's entertainment district. And there were actually police patrolling in that area. This fellow pulled out his AR-15 style rifle with a magazine that uh, accommodates 100 rounds of ammunition. So 100 rounds of ammunition before he has to reload. He shot 26 people in 30 seconds. You, mm. can't, do, you can't do that with an old style shotgun or revolver. Uh, and so even though there were police around, by the time they responded, close to 30 people were shot in half a minute. Mm -hmm. So uh, the capabilities of weapons. So not only are guns we've shown in much research, that an attack with a gun is three to five times more likely to end in a death than an attack with a knife. There are also differences between weapons, and when you get to these military-grade weapons, they're very efficient at killing large numbers of people. So yes, the gun, yes, the motives matter, but the gun also makes a huge difference in terms of the outcome of an incident. Right. Now, certainly when the... Uh framers of our Constitution uh, wrote the, the Bill of Rights, um, the, uh, you know, the <laughs> weapon of choice at that time was the musket, and it took probably, what, 30 seconds to a minute, um, depending on how skilled the uh, soldier was, to reload. That gave, you a, that gave you at least a chance to get undercover, but uh, as you said, with these, these new military-style uh, weapons, people don't stand a chance, and there's, there's such high uh, rate of carnage with these uh, now yeah. in your book you you say the simple things like hair dryers and uh, Chris, uh, um, and, and children's toys are uh, regulated by the Consumer Product Safety Commission here in the US um, but guns are not I mean it, it just seems completely ludicrous you know why why is that yeah there are about 15,000 consumer products that are uh, regulated by the Consumer Product Safety Commission for their safety and so forth. Guns were exempted by Congress. Uh, so again, uh, part of it was a push from the gun lobby. Uh, and there was a notion that this was back in the 1970s uh, when the Consumer Product Safety Commission came into being. So there was the fear even then uh, by a significant number of people in Congress that if you began to regulate the guns, you know, it's a slippery slope. You regulate this and regulate uh, military-style weapons, and before you know it, the guns are going to be confiscated. You know, this is another old narrative uh, mm -hmm. of the gun lobby and others, and this never came into being. There's never been disarmament in the United States. But you know, another thing I would like to say, so yes, uh, there's this uh, uh, exemption of the, uh, of the gun industry. They're also exempt from being sued in most cases for damages, which I think is one of the biggest problems. It was a law that was passed by the Bush administration, Bush II, and basically protecting the gun industry from liability. That's a huge one. And again, uh, we don't do that with regard to most consumer products, so they, uh, they do have an advantage. But you mentioned the Second Amendment, and I, I think it's important, without getting bogged down in it, that the framers actually, you're absolutely right, first of all, when they were talking about guns in those days, guns often loaded one bullet at a time through the muzzle. It was a completely different ball game than today. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, 
um, the framers in the Constitutional Convention of 1787, when they were drafting the Bill of Rights, these Ten Amendments, never once talked about personal gun ownership. So uh, for the first 200 years until two, uh, of our republic, the courts viewed the uh, right, right to keep and bear arms as a collective right of states to form a militia. Uh, and that's, you know, when you look at the Second Amendment, that's what it says. Uh, a well-regulated militia necessary for the security of a free state. Uh, so the framers never intended uh, that uh, every individual should own a gun for self-defense. And in 2008, though we had a decision by a conservative majority in the Supreme Court, that broke with 200 years of tradition, and they avoided the, this clause, a well-regulated militia. But even this court, we call it the Heller Court, it was the Heller decision, this conservative majority court did make it clear that the right uh, to gun ownership is not unlimited, and that the Second Amendment doesn't uh, protect or cover you know, carrying a, any kind of gun into any setting for any reason. So there's also been a, a massive distortion of the meaning of the Second Amendment, uh, particularly by the gun lobby over the last 30 to 40 years. Mm. Now, uh, in your book, you talk about um, five gun laws that protect the industry, and you touched on one of them being uh, the protection, I guess, uh, against liability um, for the gun manufacturers. Um, what are some others? Well, there's a, a general lack of regulation of gun shows, for example. And um, in most gun shows, there are people walking around selling guns who don't have a license. And uh, this is where felons, who if somebody has committed a felony, uh, generally they are prohibited from gun ownership but they can go to a gun show or they can buy guns online and undertake a private sale and get around the background check altogether. So this is one of the biggest loopholes we have in the country, that there's no screening of people buying guns uh, when uh, uh, they're buying from a private source. And there, that's why uh, there are people pushing for what's called universal background checks. So that's an enormous loophole that helps, uh, I guess, the industry to continue selling guns, uh, even to felons. But it comes at a high cost uh, to the public. Uh, mm -hmm. Another uh, set of laws, really, you would call it, and regulations that favors the gun industry is all the restrictions that have come in force um, in uh, preventing the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, which enforces gun laws on a federal level, from doing its work. So for example, the ATF, we'll call it, I'll call it Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, is limited in the number of inspections it can do in one year. So it's limited to one inspection in one year. But they've also, uh, because uh, Congress has tight, kept a tight control over their budget, um, it's been said that it will take 10 years for this Bureau of ATF to inspect every gun dealer in the country. So mm. gun dealers know that they don't have a lot of oversight, and uh, there's uh, a percentage of them each year that are responsible for a lot of guns going into circulation uh, that end up on the street, that end up in the hands of people who are at risk of violence. So there's a real problem in the, uh, the enforcement of gun laws, and the ATF has been stripped of a lot of its resources as well as its power. And uh, it's very hard to prosecute gun dealers, and you have to show that, for example, they willfully broke the law. And, and mm -hmm. what uh, 
gun traffickers, people are involved in trafficking guns around the country and on the street and so forth, they will find somebody who has a clean record to buy guns for them. That's what we call straw purchasers. And they'll go and buy a bunch of guns, and then these gun runners will run them into the cities and other places where there's a demand for them on the illegal market. So you have to prove, the ATF has to prove, that the dealer, and there's some dealers who are very actively selling to gun runners or their surrogates, that they willfully sold to this straw purchaser, this person who had a clean record. And that's very hard to prove. So again, mm. very diff it's very difficult to crack down on um, gun trafficking because of these uh, constraints on uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Mm -hmm. uh, um, recently I was reading in the paper uh, in California, the uh, San Jose City Council voted to uh, require uh, gun owners to carry a uh, liability insurance. Um, and uh, this is, as far as we know, the first measure of its kind uh, in this country. Um, is that an effective way to begin to combat the power of the, the uh, gun manufacturers? And how do you feel about that? Is it helpful? Yes, I'm a very strong proponent of that. I'm a strong proponent of both licensing as well as uh, owners, gun owners carrying insurance. Now, uh, what do I mean by licensing, first of all, and then I'll address the insurance aspect of it. Uh, here in this country, we have, in my view, not only the loophole that I talked about with regard to background checks that you, know, you can get around if you're, you have a felony record, or a history of mental illness and you're prohibited from owning a gun, you can get around that. That's, that's the loophole that we want to fill, and that's fine. But the uh, background check system itself, in my view, and I, I address it at length in my book enough, is very flawed. Uh, because we rely on basically three FBI databases. And if uh, somebody's name doesn't come up on those databases, then the sale can proceed. And usually these background checks are conducted in about two or two and a half minutes. A dealer will either through the internet or call the FBI and um, there'll be a quick check. And if the name doesn't come up, then the person, the sale can proceed. However, uh, there, uh, most of the states are far from complete and passing on criminal, juvenile history, drug, mental health records, and so on, to the FBI. So we may have somebody with a troubling history, juvenile record, a history of a, a mental illness, and that will not come up on the FBI database. So what most countries do, and a few states are doing, but not to the same extent as other countries, is you have more than just a quick instant background check is what we call it here, but rather everybody who wants to own a gun first would interview with law enforcement. Then law enforcement would conduct a number of reference checks. In Canada, for example, they also che check with spouses and ex-spouses to see if there's a history of domestic violence, because people mm -hmm. with a history of domestic violence have an elevated chance of uh, getting involved in violence and misusing firearms. There's also training required. So you need to go through this entire process before you get a license to own a gun. Now, along with that, people have proposed this idea of insurance. And I think there's no industry, no industry that's better positioned to assess risk than the insurance industry. So, uh, you know, if somebody's at higher risk, just like when we're getting insur car insurance, uh, the industry uh, will decide when somebody's seeking insurance, they might have to pay a higher premium. They may even be denied insurance. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, that is something that there'd be a lot of challenges to that, I know, in the courts. Uh, because we do have a Second Amendment, as limited as it is, the Second Amendment. And so, uh, you know, I'm not clear on whether this would pass 
legally and be upheld by the courts, but I'm a big proponent and people, you know, if you're willing to go around with a lethal product and there's certainly the possibility that somebody is going to be shot and there's going to be millions of dollars of, of expenses involved there, um, that a person should carry insurance makes perfect sense to me rather than the taxpayer footing the tab for gun violence and the reckless or negligent uses of guns. So it makes entire sense to me. Mm -hmm. You also talk about um, firearm innovation, uh, meaning that um, some uh, guns can be designed or, or altered in some way to uh, save lives. And could you talk about that and what that means? Yeah, well, just like we have, um, I guess, these fobs today, you know, keyless ways to get into, the, into your car. You have a transmitter and you have a receiver in the car and if you bring this transmitter close enough the car door opens and you can start a car the same way uh, there are technologies that are already available and i understand they're closer to being um, actually uh, guns being produced with these technologies or using the fingerprint biometric means by which a gun could only be fired if somebody had this receiver with them uh, or had the set of fingerprints that was recognized by the gun. So that technology is all there. The gun industry has opposed this for a number of reasons, cost, and in general they've opposed regulation because they fear that increasing regulation is going to <laughs> create a situation where uh, eventually guns are going to be confiscated. But there's also the concern of the industry that th these uh, te technologies will increase somewhat uh, the cost of a gun and therefore reduce sales. So uh, they've been opposed to them. But there are ways to make, you know, it takes the incentive away from stealing a gun as well. And gun theft is a big problem. And guns that are stolen, whether from cars or homes, are often used in crime. And so if a person steals a gun, but they're unable to fire it, it becomes useless to them. So uh, there are many benefits to this uh, as well. If we use these, uh, sell these smart guns to people, we call them smart guns, it's another term, then if they have these guns in the home, children, if they get a hold of a gun in the home, won't be able to fire them. Um, if mm a certain fingerprint is required, or again, these uh, fobs that we use to activate the gun, or, a, you know, could be a wrist watch. If it's not within a certain range of the gun, the gun won't fire. So it's also a way to protect young people uh, from being accidentally shot, including children, as well as uh, teenagers getting a hold of a gun. And impulsively either attempting suicide or bringing that gun to the school because mm. so basically it makes it harder for an unauthorized user or somebody who gets a hold of the gun in an unauthorized way to actually use and fire the gun. Mm -hmm. Now uh, we have a lot of uh, Americans listening to this broadcast and perhaps uh, many of them like myself feel um, overwhelmed um, and uh, sort of powerless facing, you know, a, a major uh, opponent like the gun lobby um, and the amount of money that's poured into uh, political campaigns from um, gun manufacturers. But, but one of the great things about your books is that they're very practical and they give a lot of, of hope and um, sort of a, a, a plan of action for average citizens like ourselves to um, make – uh, an, an impact in this area. So w what are some steps that um, any citizen could take to make their community safer? I'm glad you asked that, Pastor. And by the way, I forget now, I don't want to misquote uh, or uh, misspeak in terms of who this comes from, but somebody very prominent once said, nothing uh, that's worth doing comes easily. <laughs> 
And mm. uh, the one thing we have to make sure we don't lose hope in this country. I know there are many frustrated people looking at the levels of gun violence and saying, how come we haven't done anything? How come we haven't even passed uh, universal background checks that 90 percent of Americans believe in? Uh, but there are things while we get around to changing laws, there are other things that average citizens can do. Uh, one example is if you are a member of a gun owning household and about 40 percent of Americans live in a household where at least one person owns one gun, that's fine. But you can secure those guns. That's very, very important because we see um, so many tragedies occurring where uh, a young person gets a hold of a gun. How many of these school shootings were committed by guns that a young person who is despondent, maybe they had a mental health issue or whatever the circumstance, they got a hold of a gun and brought it to school. And we saw a terrible tragedy that could have been avoided. So secure those guns, you know, the same you want to prevent impulsive suicides in the home, thefts of guns from the home, terrible accidents involving children. And all this can be done by properly securing guns. And while I'm not a gun expert, I'm a gun violence expert, my uh, gun experts that I rely on tell me that even if we uh, properly lock up guns or use trigger locks, they can still be deployed quite quickly for self-defense if they're necessary. So the two are not incompatible. If you secure your gun does not mean that um, you can't use it for self-defense or conversely, that if you're so concerned about self-defense that the only way you can do it is that you have to keep loaded guns all over the house where young people can get a hold of them. So please secure your guns. Another program that many citizens are involved in is gun buybacks. And these don't have a huge impact on gun violence, but they can have some, you know, in communities where you can either organize or participate in a gun buyback. And what that generally is, is it involves local law enforcement, and they basically say that there's a complete amnesty if somebody has a gun lying around that's not being used, it doesn't matter where it's been, there's no questions asked, just turn it in. And in some cases, they might get a little bit of a, a payment or a, one of these cards, gift cards or what have you, and sometimes thousands of guns are turned back uh, in, in this way that were other, otherwise are lying around, potentially used in some tragedy. Uh, another one that I strongly believe in is in consumer activism. I'm happy to see that a few businesses like Dick's Sporting Goods and so forth have stopped selling at least the assault style weapons. Some businesses have stopped selling sporting goods and so forth. Businesses have stopped selling guns altogether. You know, and if you have an issue with the proliferation of guns in America, uh, simply uh, don't. Don't go buy in stores where they sell guns. Or, or if you have an issue in particular with these assault-style weapons, a store selling AR-15s, don't go shop there and even tell them, you know, I, I'll come shopping here when you no longer sell these guns. So the consumer has to realize that consumers have a lot of strength. They have a lot of power, especially in numbers. And you can organize groups as well to try to pressure, and this has been done, to try to pressure um, businesses not to carry at least these military-grade weapons. And another one is, is if you're investing, whether it's your retirement, your IRA, your 401k, uh, and you have mutual funds, you may decide not to tell your advisor, your financial advisor, you don't want to invest in any gun stocks. So you know, any gun companies, you don't want to invest in those, or at least gun companies that produce military-grade weapons. And uh, most importantly, I think, there are many others that I list, especially in my book, Enough, is support, donate to, and vote for candidates with clear anti-gun violence platforms. So what I mean here is, not, you know, a lot of politicians will say, yeah, I'm going to do something on gun violence, you know, and they, they uh, mouth these platitudes, these generalities. Uh, pin them down. People who are running for office, 
uh, your members of Congress or uh, state legislature, pin them down and say, what are you going to do? Are you going to support uh, background checks? Are you going to support licensing people before they own a gun? Are you going to support getting rid of military-style assault weapons held by civilians? Are, well, and pin them down and get firm commitments from them on specific policies. And when you find somebody like that, then by all means support them, donate to their campaigns, and vote for them. But make sure they know that this is a very important issue for you. And change will come. It comes grudgingly in many areas. We know that. But it will come, especially when citizens realize they have a lot of power in this area. But what's been happening is that uh, a minority of individuals who uh, are opposing any gun laws whatsoever and feel that we should be able to own an arsenal of weapons without any control, they've been more vocal, they send more money uh, to support political campaigns, they make more noise, and therefore they get more action. And it's time that ordinary citizens who are concerned about public safety, whether you're a gun owner or not, uh, make your voice heard in this area and support people who make specific commitments to change the law. Um, can you talk about the impact of uh, laws like uh, Stand Your Ground that uh, enable uh, lethal force in such certain situations? Yes, I think these laws are very troubling and they're a huge departure from what self-defense used to be in both English law and American law is based on English law, but as well American law up until the first Stand Your Ground law was passed in 2005 in Florida. These laws basically, in my view and the view of others who do research in this area, enable gun violence because they allow people to use lethal force without any duty to retreat. So basically, the Florida law and about half the states now have an, a stand-your-ground type law. And basically, these laws state that if a person believes, they have a reasonable belief that uh, they will be seriously injured or killed, that they can move immediately to lethal force. So there's no duty to retreat. So even if you could retreat, you feel in danger, somebody's threatened you, or uh, you feel they're behaving in a threatening way, uh, and you can get away, these laws say you don't need to get away. These laws say you don't need to de-escalate. Uh, and to me, it's very troubling because, first of all, we've seen increases in Florida. Uh, researchers find that there were 4,400 more homicides in Florida in the first 10 years of Stand Your Ground. Uh, attributable to the stand your ground law. And in many of these cases, people could have retreated, but we're telling people, no, you can go right to lethal force. And traditionally, this was not what self-defense laws were all about. Self-defense laws were all about being proportional to whatever the threat was and responding when you're attacked, not just when you have a belief that you're in danger. So there are many troubling aspects of these laws. And um, uh, in fact, uh, many of these behaviors where people claim they're standing your ground are really aggressive, very aggressive acts and uh, aggressive acts of self-defense at the very least. So I don't think we want to signal to young people growing up that it's okay to use lethal force even when you can find a nonviolent way to resolve a conflict. So it's troubling, and together, uh, when you have so many people carrying guns, and a combination of that and stand your ground, which allows people to use lethal force in a wide variety of situations, even though they could get out of the situation, that's a very uh, mix, uh, troubling cocktail, as far as I'm concerned. And we've seen that stand your ground laws typically increase the rates of homicide in a state that adopts these laws by about 8 to 10 percent. Mm -hmm. um, one last question, um, and then we'll need to go, but uh, you talk also in your book about 
the right to live in a gun violence free society as a, a basic human right. Can you talk about how you got interested in that um, area of this of this topic? I would be delighted because you know people are constantly saying, well, what about our? Don't we have a right um, to be protected from gun violence? Don't we have a right to live? And in fact, as I dug deep, more deeply, first of all, into the Second Amendment, <clears throat> it became clear um, that that. Uh, the Second Amendment right, as we call it, the right to keep and bear arms, is limited. Um, it also became apparent that uh, when we look at the Declaration of Independence, when we look at certain amendments within the Constitution and international agreements that America has signed, that uh, we have, it's clear that our governments have a duty to protect their citizens from gun violence. I'll give you an example. Declaration of Independence says that the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, they're inalienable rights. They're not rights that could be tampered with or limited. They're inalienable rights, the right to life. And the Constitution, both the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, talk about, again, uh, not being deprived of one's life, life without due process of law, not being allowed to be deprived of one's life uh, in an arbitrary way. And then the United States has signed or ratified many international agreements, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about the right to life, uh, property, and uh, security of the person. We signed on to that. We ratified that. In fact, we were Eleanor Roosevelt was an initiator of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the United States has violated its own uh, commitment to safeguard the right of its own citizens uh, from, uh, from violence. And uh, we've been condemned by human rights groups from doing so. So what I've done, I invite you all I have a website called thomasgaborbooks.com, and there you'll see what I call my Declaration of the Right to Live Free from Gun Violence. And it's basically a Bill of Rights for citizens who are concerned about, uh, about gun violence and also believe that the government has a responsibility to protect us from violence. You know, legal scholars have been saying for centuries that there's a social contract between the citizen and its government. And what the government does, you know, we pay our taxes, we, uh, we protect, um, we, uh, we serve in the military when called to do so, we obey the laws. But the first duty of government is to protect its citizens from harm. And in this area, I think we have not been uh, the government in the United States, as well as many states, has really not upheld its part of the bargain, its, its part of the social contract. So this is how I got to that. Well, thank you, Dr. Thomas Gabor. He's the uh, former professor of criminology for 30 years at the University of Ottawa and author um, of several books on gun violence, gun policy and other criminal justice issues. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, discussing this topic tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Appreciate it. And this is uh, Pastor S.J. Munson signing out.